All right, welcome to another show. The Research to Reps Roundtable. We've got the band back together. First up, introducing, I'll introduce myself. I'm Pat Ivey, one of your co-hosts. Uh, your next co-host, we have Ted Lambernitas. How you doing Ted. today? Oh, we're doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. Good, doing, good to see you. Good to see you. I'm, nice to see you. Yeah, I think you're getting younger, Ted. I don't know. Are you get a new light or something? <laughs> what's going on? It must be the lighting. You got makeup going? What's what's going on? There's some <laughs> that's good. And uh I'm I'm really happy to see uh Javar. I know it's <laughs> you had a great run and um you I know you guys hit the reset button and things move fast. So great to see you. Great to have you back. Yeah, it's good to be back. Good to see y'all. Uh, I'm excited to uh, to get talking here today. Absolutely, absolutely. Ted, if you want to introduce our guest uh, of honor here, and we can get this thing cracking. I had the uh, good fortune of, uh, you know, meeting uh, Mark several years ago uh, when he just got hired by the uh, Detroit Lions. We spoke at a... Uh, uh, a uh, brain health symposium that the uh, university or uh, Ohio State University put on and uh, really impressed with uh, you know his knowledge uh, he gave a great presentation and we've had numerous meetings uh, when he was up at the Detroit Lions but he's got a wealth of knowledge that I think your listeners are going to really uh, benefit from I'll let Mark give his background information but, um, you know, he, he's got a very unique background in terms of the population that he's supervised and does research with. That's uh, really fascinating. And uh, I think he'll be able to, uh, you know, I don't think he's at liberty to discuss everything he's done with the groups that he trains, but uh, he's going to uh, have a wealth of information that I think are going to benefit the listeners. And I'll let Mark go ahead and give his background in, in more detail. Oh, good, great. Thanks for having me. Uh, I really appreciate you guys uh, inviting me to this. I'm pretty excited about uh, just chatting about everything. It's great to, to share some intellectual knowledge here. But, uh, you know, as Ted said, you know, my background you know, originally, uh, you know, started working in sports, but um, spent most of the past several years working with uh, the military and special operations, specifically with human performance and uh, performance optimization. Uh, the past uh, two years, uh, I had the pleasure of working with a friend of mine who is the head coach at the Detroit Lions. Uh, so working with that organization and the Ford family, which was an awesome experience. Um, so I did that for the past two years. This year, I'm still with them consulting, but I uh, moved back to the DOD working with uh, West Virginia University's Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute and that team there that does a lot of uh, uh, research uh, with the military and uh, public safety and so forth, uh, specifically in areas of human performance optimization. My area is basically more in stress uh, and recovery and performing under stress. So uh, I had a lot of great experiences working with that and continue doing that. And I'm, I'm stoked to be here. Yeah. How, how does the sport background marry with the back with what you do now? Yeah, it's, you know, that's a very interesting question because a lot of people ask that, especially with the two, you know, we call them tactical athletes. Um, and basically we're, we're, we're applying the physiology, human physiology to, to that sector. But the difference between, you know, sport athlete and the tactical athlete is really just the, the game, the mission and so forth. But at the end of the day, they're all human beings. Human behavior is the same. You know, we, we forget that even with our athletes and our general population at the end of the day, they're just human beings. So it's how do we, how do we apply it to their specific task at hand? And that's been the most interesting thing. Now, Mark, when you were talking about um, uh, a lot of emphasis on the uh, managing of stress and dealing with stress, uh, this has been a rather unique year. If you layer what you normally see with what's gone on in 2020, uh, what differences have you seen and what adjustments have you had to make with your tactical athletes? 
Well, I think, you know, it's the same thing that everybody's dealing with, right? <clears throat> so we have this uh, very unique situation for everybody. Everybody's out of their, their norm, regardless of where you're at. Um, obviously, that's globally, but specifically here, um, you know, you compound that with, you know, what's going on, you know, nationally with, uh, you know, politics and, you know, social injustice and all that stuff. So that's where you see a lot of things marrying up, whether it's the <clears throat> military side or the sports side. Um, of course, I'm seeing both on that end. I think what we're going to see, you know, a lot, a lot of people are having a tough time dealing with it. You know, it's, you know, you might be dealing with it okay, but then your spouse or your kids or somebody else is having difficulty. So that compounds the stress uh, in itself. But we're starting to see, you know, signs, whether it's the, you know, the frontline workers or whatever of, of this PTSD type uh, syndrome going on. And, you know, people haven't experienced this before. They don't know how to deal with it. They don't have the resources. Fortunately, in the military, there's a, more resources available and we're a little bit more attuned to looking out for that. But, um, you know, it's, it's hitting them hard, just like everybody else. I think they just have uh, access to better resources at this point. Yeah, we, we um, experience a lot of uh, change, right? Um, in college, we're trying to figure out how can we continue to play and, and compete while the medical community is trying to figure out how to um, keep everyone's health at the forefront. So this, this health and performance, uh, sometimes we, we're trying to... Um, walk that, uh, you know, health is on one side, performance is on the other, and we're trying to walk right down the middle. And it, it's not easy because there's new information coming in daily. And how do you take that information and then apply it? Yeah, I think, you know, <clears throat> it, it's, it's hard because the information is, is changing all the time. As scientists, you know, we know that, you know, we, we don't listen to the media. The media doesn't know. All the experts they have on, they don't know. Nobody knows. We're, you know, everybody's learning as, as it goes. As scientists, we, we understand that. And we're a little bit more patient with the information coming out. But when you have to put it into action quickly, um, whether it's, you know, from the medical side or the performance side or the sports side, you know, we have to understand that the mental health is part of that overall well-being of medical health. And it's not so simple to say, okay, I mean, the easiest thing to do is everybody stay home, lock yourself in, a, in, a, in the house and so forth. But that's not going to keep people completely healthy, unfortunately. So, you know, we have to find out ways we can mitigate the impact and, and be as safe as possible. Um, if it weren't for human behavior, we probably would be okay because everybody just do what they're supposed to do. But with human behavior, you know, especially, um, you know, different personalities, different age groups, you know, feel they're more resilient than others. And, you know, just as when we were younger, you know, we could do anything. We're not going to get hurt. We're okay. But um, that plays a role into it. So we just have to balance that. And, and we can't necessarily shove things down the throat of people because that creates resistance in itself even if they believe you're, you're right, but we just have to figure out a way, how do we mitigate that? I mean, the NBA obviously did a, a, an incredible job, but it took just, you know, putting a bubble up. So there, there's repercussions to that, you know, to be that a long-term sustainment option, but it got them through a piece of a period of time that it was effective and we know it can be done. Um, they've proven it. We have a lot of monitoring things that we can look into to help, uh, you know, buy down our risk, if you will. But it, it's tough. It, it's, it's tough when you're combating, you know, different information come out all the time. Now, Mark, with some of your uh, tactical athletes that say might be on missions where they're completely sleep deprived or they're coming off, a, let's just say a week where they're, they had sleep deprivation. Well, what are some strategies, recovery modalities that you found useful um, in, in that situation? Well, I, you know, you know, we have, we have an environment of chronic 
uh, deprivation, if you will, for sleep. <laughs> uh, some of that is uh, self-imposed. Some of that is, you know, scheduling. Um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of different factors. So <clears throat> if we're in a training environment, we have a little bit more control. We have a little bit more resources to our, you know, um, excuse me, available to us. But, you know, we have everything from specific modalities, simple things like, you know, um, even just massage, breathing techniques, things like that to help, um, you know, reset yourself to, you know, using uh, PBM with the light beds, the near infrared light beds, the float tanks, the cryo stimulation tanks, the ice baths, and so forth. So those things help us uh, reset that on and off nervous system, which gets, you know, thrown off when that sleep cycle gets thrown off. When we're deployed, it's, it's not as easy, right? Because we don't have all those things. We don't have float tanks in the back of the planes or anything like that. So um, we have to rely on a lot of, uh, um, you know, we call pa passive methods. I'm sorry, uh, active methods where you're doing more like uh, the breathing techniques. And there's different types, you know, from the Winhoff methods to the to the diaphragmatic breathing, to the, you know, prolonged exhalation methods, um, meditation, believe it or not. And then just, you know, regular fitness actually helps with the, resetting that sleep cycle. Um, just make sure that they're not overtraining and then they're not under training. Um, so those are the things that we help. There are, are supplementation type uh, things that we might look to, uh, but they're not always available in the deployment setting as well. So yeah, I no. think the, the, what you're mentioning there is you just have those tools in the toolbox and you can choose, you know, the best one that fits, like you can individualize. And I think that's been the major key. You mentioned the bubble. I mean, that was the key was the game of adjustments, having and being able to travel uh, and, and bring some things with you that you, you don't normally uh, have in the facility that you're usually working out of. So um, one of the keys that I found was the education part while we were in the, in the, uh, in quarantine and we were at home, we were stuck in our homes, uh, just taking, you know, whether it be zoom, uh, you know, similar to this, uh, you know, and just some educational, um, things we, we, we talked to, uh, you know, a few experts, a few athletes from, and, and basically created this cross-cultural experience. Uh, so I think that would be awesome for athletes and uh, performance individuals just to hear, you know, the things you're doing, uh, you know, in, in your world to help our athletes in our world. You know, it's that cross-cultural experience. We don't necessarily uh, have to go in the field of battle, but uh, there are certain things that we can do uh, in our environment as well. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and the key, the, the two key things that you said, or one is the education piece. You know, whether it's the military, the sport, or wherever, I mean, the education piece is critical. That's the foundation. You can throw all the tools you want. If they don't know how to use it, they don't know why they're using it, it's not going to work. Um, and then individualizing it. Not everybody's going to uh, react the same way or have the same effects. Some people need, you know, this modality. Some other people need that modality. Not everybody's feeling, they're not modulating the stress the same way. And one thing that we were able to do um, in, in the the special ops community where you have a little bit more uh, interaction with, with the, the folks is you're, you're teaching them that they're in control of their own physiology. And once they learn those tools and techniques, adding these exterior tools, such as like, you know, the, the light bed, the, the cryo stem or the float or whatever, that just helps, um, you know, it, you know, exaggerates those effects in some cases where it can get them there quicker, but it doesn't negate what they need to do on a daily basis. And don't, you know, nutrition is a big part of it, but, you know, there's not one diet that's best, right? It's that somewhat is individualized and some people re, uh, respond better to different diets than others. So uh, we're fortunate we have uh, performance dietitians that can attack that end. And it, it's just a, it's really a teamwork of all disciplines coming together and, you know, addressing that issue and it come you know that stress thing is not just you know the psychological physical stress of all the training but it's being able to perform under stress perform under pressure so you know it, it translates from there to to the field to the court to the battlefield yeah so in the battlefield what what is the typical 
training routine, a generalized training routine for a soldier? Well, you know, fitness is fitness, right? So at some point we get a little bit too fancy, um, but we just know we have to increase VO2 max. Um, and that can be done in several ways. They don't have to go out and run, you know, five, 10 miles to do that. Uh, and we need, we need some basic strength. We don't need absolute brute strength, but we need strength so they can endure the, the rigors of whatever's going on. It gets specific when we know what the mission is. All right. So they go into a certain terrain or certain, you know, um, climate, certain altitude or, you know, length of time, you know, are they going to be climbing mountains? Are they just going to be, you know, you know, hitting it and getting out? It, there's several factors that come into it. So that's where the specialization of having those professionals, whether they're strength and conditioning professionals, uh, athletic trainers, physical therapists, dietitians, psychologists and sports psychologists, they all, then they can um, individualize it to that mission set. So one group might be doing training one way and another group might train another way. Um, but fitness is fitness and that's, that's the beauty of it. So we can, you know, generalize keeping them fit and, and you know, you're, you're gonna have that foundation. Mark, that sounds interesting. That sounds like something I would have wanted to be a part of or do. Sounds completely different than one of my favorite movies, Full Metal Jacket. Oh, my, one of my favorites. Gunnery Sergeant Hartman laying into him. Like you're talking about science and sleep. I, that's not the, I don't think there's much out there from a perception standpoint that shows exactly where things are and what you do. Um, it's more of some person yelling at you while you're standing in line if your shoes aren't shined uh, like they should be. So how do you uh, how do you deal with some of those perceptions? Well, it's it, you, you change the perception, right? So if it, it's it comes down to threat. If we get right to our primal brain, you know, at the end of the day, threat's a threat. So if you're a quarterback and some guy's running in your face, or you're on the battlefield, you know, we could see and say, well, you know, that's life or death, and that's just a game. But in the moment, your brain is it doesn't distinguish that threat's a threat. So we, so that's what we address. So how do we change that perception of threat? Okay. And, and when we can do that, then you're in control. So whether that threat is life or death or that threat is, you know, that guy running in your face, um, you know, that, that's the goal is how do we change it, that perception of threat? It's not, there's no textbook to say you do this or that. So, you know, we're fortunate where we can do a lot of monitoring and, you know, that's where a lot of my work is in heart rate variability, because that is the, the, the check engine light for the whole on and off nervous system. And we can tell you how you're handling it. And then when we give you strategies to, to change that perception or, you know, uh, you know, you know, reframe it, we can see how the body's responding to that. Oh, oh this strategy works for you, but it might be a different strategy for someone else. But when we're monitoring that HRV, we can tell when it's working and then, and it's almost like a biofeedback for that individual. They know, they feel it, and then they eventually they can do it on demand. That's what we're trying to get to. So you're talking about you know heart rate variability. You know we'll we'll often cover an athlete's readiness. I'm interested. How do you communicate to the tactical athlete based on heart rate variability? you know, their overall readiness. And let's just say that there's a time where the, the guy's not physiologically, right, ready, uh, quote unquote, ready. Uh, he might be fatigued or overly stressed. How do you communicate to the athlete uh, so that it doesn't mess their mentality up? It doesn't mess their perception up uh, right before they go into battle? Well, um very uh, good question and a very real scenario. Uh, so, you know, going back probably about 10 years when we started really looking and diving into it, you know, at the end of the day, and guys come up to you and said, listen, I don't care if I'm right or not, I'm going out the door. Right. You know, right. Um, and you know, that's the reality of it. You know, a guys got a broken leg. They want to go out the door. So it wasn't about saying you're not ready to go. We got to get you ready. It's about, this is what you need to do to always be ready. 
And that's where we start diving into all the recovery stuff. And now, now you hear about everything, but when we started, it wasn't out there. You know, you know, the resurgence of float tanks is because of the work we started doing. Not that we created the float tanks, they were there, but nobody was using them in that way. And then we were actually researched to see what was going on and continue to do that. And it came the cryo stem, it came, you know, then we start looking back, okay, what are the medallions that we've been using that, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's just doctrine now, like, a, you know, I jump in the ice tub, why are we jump in the ice tub? And we start looking at, we looked at it differently. We looked at the effect of the on our nervous system, not the muscle, you know, you know, we can look at the, you know, lactate levels, all that, but, you know, and there's, you know, hey, it works here. It really doesn't work here. It's not that significant. But when we looked at the autonomic nervous system, it was significant. So even some of the stuff we've been doing anyway, we just validated that it actually has an effect, not the effect we thought it was working, but it overall has effect because if the autonomic nervous system is optimal, everything else will fall into place. So we attacked it from keeping you ready in recovery. So recovery is the key to being optimal and always being ready. So you're never not ready. You're just more ready than, you know, you might be more ready today than you were yesterday, but we want to keep you in sustain because the mission for us was how do we sustain high performance? Not, you know, enhance is one thing, but how do we sustain it? Sure. So and that, that was the key. And so that's where we really started working into the recovery realm. And then obviously with the wearables, everything's been exploding in that realm. Um, and I think technology is getting better that, you know, some of these bigger, you know, inconvenient devices, we can get to where they're portable and more convenient to be used. Now, Mark, one uh, topic that uh, is prevalent with tactical athletes coming back from, you know, missions and, and really and you would probably experienced this with some of your veteran uh, NFL players, uh, different strategies for for pain mitigation, you know what some what some research that, or methods that uh, you you know have been helpful with the population that you're dealing with. Right. So you know, <clears throat> one one key area we'll, we'll we'll talk the brain first, and you know again it comes down to perception of threat. Pain is a perception of threat, right? It's it's real. It's physiologically real. But the level of pain tolerance can be modulated, you know, by reframing. So it's educating them that way, not saying, hey, your pain's not real, but just, you know, help them understand what that pain cycle is. But when we start looking at the, you know, when we look at damage from an injury standpoint, <clears throat> inflammation, um, you know, muscle tears, micro tears, all that stuff, uh, we know it's really damage at the mitochondrial level. And then that's, you know, that's where the dysfunction is and, it's, and the healing process is to get that back online. So one of the, the big areas right now is that near infrared spectrum has been very good at that. Now it's, it's, not, it's not that new in the medical community, but it's in the medical community, they use it just on spots, right? So I'm gonna take that laser, cold laser, whatever, put it on that area and I'm gonna affect that area. We're looking at actually whole body um, penetration versus just the, the one area, um, which, you know, there's a lot of math that goes into it that I don't do the math to get other people to do the math, but um, to get the power spectrum correctly. But what we're seeing with the near infrared spectrum is a lot of uh, regeneration happening uh, for a lot of disease illnesses, including injuries. So um, that's one of the newer things that we've been trying to bring online. The, the, the problem in the, in the commercial community is there's not many out there. And the ones that it seems like there's a lot out there, but most of them don't work correctly because of the, the way it has to go. But there are a few portable ones. There's certainly some bigger ones that cost a fortune, but, um, but there's a lot of work and technology going right now to get those uh, more on a, um, almost like a wearable. Um, and, you know, a lot of the work's being done in the, the veterinarian community right now. Um, that's just spilling over into the, the, the human population. Um, the science is there. It's just getting the technology to be there. Mark, if you could uh, send every um, soldier home uh, with an unlimited amount of equipment, no budget, what would you send them home with so that they had it in their house? 
Oh God, that, that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have, I, I'd probably build a suite that would have a float tank. Oh, uh, it's the biggest bang for your buck right there. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I'd have, I'd have, you know, a uh, cryo stimulation chamber. I would have uh, probably you definitely a, a PBM, a light bed of near infrared, um, even a, a sauna, um, a, a red light sauna or infrared, an infrared sauna, which is different than near infrared, but does have some benefits. Um, and then obviously, you know, a good, uh, good mattress <laughs> for, for sure. <laughs> Good mattress, but um, I think the key thing is the monitoring devices. Having something that they can monitor their 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 readiness, their sleep, and their HRV accurately. And there's not a lot out there that can do that, but there are some. Um, again, I think in the next couple of years, there's going to be a lot more available because technology is getting better. But um, but one that can do it all, not just I got to wear five devices to get all those five things or whatever it is which right now nobody really has. How much do those devices cost? <laughs> oh God, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think they probably average about uh, $300, uh, three to $400 per device. Uh, you know, you know, like, you know, uh, Javak tell you like, you know, he's, the Aura Ring um, is a pretty decent one. It does some good stuff, but it doesn't do everything that we need to look at. Um, you know, you have some uh, wrist worn ones that, you know, are pretty good. It's tracking sleep is difficult. You know, we can track sleep by, you know, how much you move and, and, and so forth and, and your, your core body temperature and your respiration. But getting the actual brain waves um, without putting something on your head, we, it's not there yet. No device can do the sleep stages accurately right now, um, commercially. I mean, obviously, there's lab devices that can do it for sure. So, um, but yeah, I mean, even, you know, there's some good devices that do some things really good, but none of them do everything or enough. Mark, could you uh, discuss a little bit uh, with some of your tactical athletes when they come back in terms of, uh, and I saw this when I visited uh, the Rockefeller there, is the, some of the transcranial stimulation um, therapies. Uh, right. Yeah, so, I mean, there, there's some work going on um, with different types of brain stimulation. And, you know, some of it's, you know, direct current TDCS, and then um, some of it's uh, magnetic uh, TMS, um, but it's all transcranial. So it's considered non-invasive. It's not something that's, you know, new, it's just a new application. So um, working with folks that have had um, a lot of MTBI exposures from blasts or hits or whatever, um, those small repetitive um, hits add up to a lot we're finding out and so with the transcranial stimulation on that side of it it's can we retrain the brain waves to be more coherent and that's that's the goal <clears throat> and traditionally with the magnetic the transcranial magnetic stimulation you know the protocols were hey if we can get everybody at 10 hertz and but what we found is 10 hertz is kind of an average but everybody's a, bit, a little bit different. So instead of it being, you know, either nine or 10 or nine and a half and 10, the, you know, the new thing is making an analog where you can make it 9.8, 9.9, 10.1, find out where that person is optimal. So there's um, different devices or protocols that I'll look at that. Um, and when they take other things into account, um, some do better than others, but it's pretty effective. Right now, it's still considered what they call off-label because it's more, uh, it's, it was designed for depression, but now we're finding it's effective for other things. So, uh, you know, there's works going on, studies going on to <clears throat> get that approved through FDA uh, eventually for other uh, diagnosis. Then there's a thing called, um, you know, neuropriming where we can actually stimulate different parts of the brain uh, depending on what we're trying to do. So if it's decision-making, learning, executive function, things like that, you know, we can stimulate the 
prefrontal cortex or if it's skill acquisition, we can stimulate the motor cortex. So there's been some um, positive effects with that, um, but not, we can't say it's significant yet. So there's still a lot of work going on there from that side. And this is all non-invasive where it doesn't, um, the, the changes aren't permanent. So it's, you know, taking advantage, can we accelerate the process of neuroplasticity and get the mind in the right um, state, the brain in the right state to optimize that neuroplasticity? So that's the goal. And, you know, we can do that in floating, but that's, you know, it's a longer process. But at the end of the day, um, it's time on task like anything else. So it's nothing you can do once or twice. It's something that's going to have to be done several times till that you know, what you're trying to improve, improves. Once that improves, that's permanent, but the brain um, structures, you know, you're not making permanent changes there. You're just making, you know, temporary changes to take advantage of neuroplasticity. So how would you, in the field, how would you measure improvements utilizing tools like that? Or even if you're just, any tool that you're trying to, to train neuroplasticity, how, how would you assess that in the field? Well, I mean, a lot, I mean, it, it, you can tell by how, well, first of all, let's say quality of life. That's a huge one. So if they, if that person feels that they can do their job more proficiently, then that's, you know, you can consider that improvement, quality of life improvement. From an objective standpoint, it, it depends on what we're measuring because there's so many different tasks. If we're looking at somebody that's a you know, looks at, you know, um, video all day, um, you know, from, you know, satellite, you know, videos, you know, are they more, are they less fatigued or are they picking up more um, information? So that's one way. If it's, you know, you know, if it's motor skill, like, you know, you know, is the marksmanship better, you know, can they shoot, you know, more accurately at a faster pace? Um, you know, why they're moving, shoot, move, and communicate. Does that get better? So a lot of their peers will actually do the, the, the grading of that, you know? So, you know, hey, if they're not performing, they're going to get thrown out anyway. So, uh, so that's, that's the one thing. But, um, you know, it's, it is hard objectively because it's what are we trying to do? You know, what are we trying to improve? It could be learning a, a new language or it could be learning a new dialect of a new language. So... Yes. So no, I, I was, I, I was trying to, to objectively assess it. We we were wearing, it was the I can't think of the name of it right now, but those uh, the halo. He, yes, yes, yeah. and we were wearing them, and we were doing stuff pregame with them, and um, you know, obviously in in sport and in the NBA, you know, this is a brand new thing that you know guys hadn't seen. So I was trying to figure out a way to to you know assess. It. And so I brought the guys up there and I had them shooting free throws. And I just remember a skill coach coming on the court and being like, what are we doing here? <laughs> what is going on? Yeah. And, it, uh, you know, it was, it was actually kind of funny, but, uh, yeah. you know, we're just trying to find ways to, to, yeah. to apply so, the mean, technology. So. Yeah. Technically it works, right? So if you're there, um, here's the downside. It, you know, whatever technique you're using, that's what you're reinforcing. So that person's shooting poorly and they have that on, they're shooting poorly and they're going to make that more permanent. So you want to make sure coaching goes along with that, you know, usage. So if someone has a poor free throw percentage generally, and they put those on, you want to make sure that they're being coached to make that better why they have those on. Right. Yeah. Um, so that, that's, you know, if you're performing bad and you put those on, you're going to perform bad more permanently. <laughs> so. Well, I I thought it was, I thought it was novel, just you know, especially a young athlete who's who needs to learn a specific skill. In our world, it might be learning a new move, right? You're, right. You have a big who has to finish at the rim with with one specific move, and just to to coordinate that uh, over repetition. I thought it was an interesting uh, and novel way to to try to speed, you know, because it's it'll happen over time. But sure. if we can speed the time up you know, that obviously yeah. is productive. So. And you can speed the time up, but it's not in days, right? So, you know, they're still going to need about, you know, four to six weeks of right. consistent usage of doing it. So the, the problem in sports, that's more of an off season thing because in season, you know, you know, a month and a half, two months is going to be like half the season over. So, uh, 
you know, so you want to work on those mostly on the off season, not saying you can't do some on the in season, but um, you just have to realize it's still time on task. It is an accelerated way to do it, but it's just not instantaneous. You still have to put time in. And, and last question on this, because it, it, it really um, intrigues me, but would it be better to do, is it a gross motor skill acquisition or is it more fine motor, like throwing tennis balls and ha catching them and more of a reactive base thing, or is it more of a, a gross skill movement? Well, so it depends. So the halo that you're discussing only, they're only targeting the motor cortex. So yeah, it's, I mean, it can be fine motor movement, anything in the motor cortex. It's just, again, one, it has to be done correctly. So you're reinforcing the correct pattern. Um, but, you know, reaction time is a little different. And that's where it gets confusing because that's more of a decision, right? We, we call it reaction, but the brain gets a stimulus. It's a threat. It decides what it's going to do and it, re and it reacts to it. So that's more prefrontal cortex, but using more to court motor function to execute the, the finished mm -hmm. movement. So, um, you know, you'd have to stimulate, you know, a uh, different part of the brain to, to reinforce that as well, which, uh, you know, the, the halo that you see is designed specifically for the motor cortex, but they didn't start out that way. They actually, you know, had a, I call it a bench unit, a lab unit where, you know, um, you, with the wet sponges you put on like the old days, that's how they mm -hmm. started out. And you can stimulate all parts of the brain, just the way they have it set up, you know, from a, a business standpoint, they felt that it was best just to target that. And it was more appealing because I had those conversations like, Hey, we want it to do this, this, and this. So, sure. but yeah, but yeah, you could, I mean, you can do it. It's just, you gotta, you have to stimulate a different part of the brain. Javar, I know a few years back, visual training was big. I don't know if you all are doing any. And Mark, where are you all with just the whole, because um, I've, I've visited the Air Force Academy and they awesome have a vision there. training lab out there. So, you know, are you doing any, Javar? And Mark, where are you all with that? Yeah, so we, right now we're using Synoptic. Um, and we're, we're trying to get more involved with them. Uh, you know, there, I've, I think I've tried everything out there on the market because this is a big, uh, you know, when it comes to transfer onto the court, right? Um, from the weight room to the court, I think this is the missing uh, component uh, to that is, is if we can, um, you know, include some uh, neurocognitive ability involved with our training. Um, Right now, Synoptic seems to provide a, a decent environment uh, for us to train. Like my key is, can I involve in, in training, right? Where they're actually moving at the same time versus uh, how we might assess, which might be on a computer screen or something like that and we're not moving, right? So I think if we could take that assessment and then apply it to the training, I think that's the key. So yeah, we've been playing around with that. Um, I built a nine foot wide treadmill uh, had it custom made so I could do some reactive things on there in the weight room. Uh, so just trying to be novel and, and kind of innovative in our uh, ideas. But, um, you know, I don't, uh, that's pretty much where we're at right now. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> a, a very similar where, you know, you know, we went to the Air Force Academy and looked at everything they had. What can we bring You know, we, <clears throat> you know, had a, an old DynaVision V2 back in the day. But how do we get that, you know, progressed out? Because that's a little bit limiting uh, compared to something like the Synaptic. So uh, we were with the test beds. Nike had this sensory uh, board, and uh, which is the Synaptic now. But um, mm -hmm. uh, and it was big and cumbersome. Then, uh, you know, then it morphed into the synaptic, you know, the engineers broke off. Well, Nike discontinued it and the engineers were able to, um, act, you know, get the patents from Nike and start, start their own, which is synaptic, which is a lot more advanced than what Nike ever had. Um, there's a lot of great things with the, um, the, the different visual trainings and reaction times that, 
we we'll call inhibition, the go, no goes. Um, those are all building on, you know, neurocognitive functions. So it is vision training, but it also is uh, neurocognitive training, more so neurocognitive training. Uh, I think, you know, that's one of the better devices out there. I think what we'll see in the, uh, in the near future is in a virtual uh, world that having the same type of thing, imagine doing a synaptic in a, in a real virtual world, not just the 3D glasses. Um, but you the, just explained my dissertation, by the way. <laughs> that, <laughs> you, you just nailed down what, what I'm doing for my dissertation. So uh, yeah. <laughs> nice. I'll be contacting you. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there's, you know, but some of the other stuff like at the Air Force Academy where they're doing, you know, work in the muscles of the eyes, really, in those lines, especially when, you know, that 24 year old uh, all of a sudden accelerates to 32 years old and they're like, they don't understand that their vision's going when they, because it's so gradual to them. So keeping things up like that is, is helpful. But what we're looking for and what you're looking for really is, is a sustainment factor. So um, the problem with all this stuff is the, on the transferability. It, it might not be an exact transfer to a skill set, but if it's sustaining their performance and adds to that sustainment, that's, that's a win, uh, especially at the professional level um, or you know, uh, you know, a D1 level where, um, you know, there's finances tied to that. So, um, it, you know, so that's where it gets significant. In the scientific world, we might say, oh, it's not that significant statistically. But, you know, you, know, you shave off, you know, a hundredth of a second on somebody in the sport world, that's significant, right? But in the science world, that's like, we don't even look at that. So um, there, there, I think a lot of those trainings help, um, even just playing catch on a, you know, unstable surface, back and forth, different color balls. So you can go low tech to high tech, but anything to keep you active and going is, is going to at least reinforce that. But like anything else, it's time on task. Nothing's happening overnight. Yeah, Ted, what, what does, uh, from a research standpoint, can you think of any um, recent research when it comes to vision training? I, I think there's been some uh, recent that have, uh, you know, looked at the effects of vision training on concussion reduction. Uh, it appears to be somewhat promising. And then uh, there was also two recent articles published within the last few weeks, looking at uh, the uh, the goggles with the the strobes. Strobe strobes and uh, the beneficial effects of that. And, and to Mark's point, it's time on task. And, um, but I think some of those tools that you can add uh, have value. Yeah, and I think when it comes to concussions, the one thing that we have to <clears throat> remember that if someone sustains a concussion that has lingering effects, so in the, I'll, I'll talk in the NFL world, we don't have a lot of times, you know, 17 weeks, you know, really to, so someone's out for, you know, a period of time and, and doesn't clear that, you know, they can miss two or three games. But when we look at a lot of these interventions to say, Hey, this can help you get better. And then, you know, they, they, they take six, eight, 10 weeks to do. So, you know, the people in the sporting world are like, oh, that doesn't help me out. But what I think we're forgetting in the sporting world is it does help you out because what's happening with these folks is they may clear. And, you know, even if it's three weeks to clear, it doesn't matter. There's the lingering effects. We know that now and it's accumulative over time. But if, if we, even if they clear and play, but we, they stay on this intervention for say eight weeks, they may be better off, you know, the next season as opposed to if they didn't do it. So, you know, we have to take that into consideration. Don't just, you know, push it aside because it doesn't fit into your return to play timeline. We have to think beyond return to play. We have to think about quality of life and quality of playing the next season or the off season in addition to that. Yeah, when we talk about concussions, um... I mean, <clears throat> the brain makes everything go, right? And that's, <laughs> so it's not just the brain that is, uh, that has been damaged, but what it controls. 
its ability to control the rest of the body. I mean, um, consciously, subconsciously, the autonomic. I mean, there's a lot of things that it's doing that we're not aware of, that we're not aware of, but if you damage it, um, you know, it's, I think it's very important, especially me being a former football player. It's something I think about a lot. And we used to joke about, you know, why do we have these headaches? It's in two a days. And I remember asking a defensive coordinator, hey, coach, everyone on the team has headaches. He's like, yeah, it's called two a day headaches, and everyone's got them. Oh, okay. We'll tough it up. <laughs> but we've come a long way since then. Um, but a lot of the guys that I played with, you know, here we are 20, 20 years later, um, having to still live life, you know, still trying to, to make sure that uh, we, we can function. So uh, I'm glad the research is going where it is. And, and I'm glad we're, um, we're paying attention. This, to me, sports science is something that has to become more prominent. It had, just like we talk about nutrition, just like we talk about being a strength and conditioning coach, just like we talk about being an athletic trainer. The sports scientist has to have a seat at the table. Um, it's, it's the foundation of everything that we do. And it's, it seems like this is one of the last people at the table. Um, so what, I don't know what you think about that, Mark. But no, no, I, I totally agree. You know, I think part of the problem is a lot of coaches, um, you know, sport coaches, or even some of, you know, our colleagues in strength and conditioning, <clears throat> you know, still think of it as data science. Well, it's just all the data. You're just, you know, okay, you know, load management, all that stuff. They don't realize it's, it's taking all those pieces, putting it into context, and then giving you an actionable, um, you know, option. So, hey, because of all these things that you're not tracking, because, you know, that's not your job, you know, the sports scientist has to track all the, you know, from the rehabilitation side, the nutrition side, the psychosocial side, the strength and conditioning side, and the practice load side, and the coaching perspective of the player side, put the together and say, okay, this is how we need to man manage this athlete. And then you get all those disciplines together and say, hey, this is what's going on. This is how we can optimize this athlete. That's a sports scientist's role. Um, but really it gets, you know, regulated down to, hey, just uh, give me the, the catapult numbers or the zebra numbers or whatever. And it's like, okay, but you don't know what to, you know, they mean nothing stand alone and you can't get them to understand that. So uh, it, it's, a, it's still a hard sell because people just view it more as, well, you're a data scientist. Like, trust me, I am not a data scientist. <laughs> uh, think, um, Mark, go ahead, Ted. Um, when you um, look at everything you're doing and if we look like if we superimpose cannabis on whether it be an athlete or a tactical athlete, um, what has been your experience when you superimpose, you know, cannabis into the, into the equation? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, we have cannabis receptors in, in the body and, and there's a lot of good benefits to it, you know, but there are, there are ways to extract that, that the, the therapeutic effects um, don't involve any of the stuff that, you know, would be considered, you know, like with THC or anything, you can get all that stuff, get rid of all the THC, like with the oils, the CBD oils, you know, there, there are ways to get the therapeutic benefits without getting the, the other stuff that um, may or may not like, you know, if it's, if you're just talking marijuana, you know, we don't need to have the, you know, all that smoke going into your lungs to get the benefits of cannabis, right? So, you know, how can we get rid of some of the stuff that isn't as healthy to get the stuff that is beneficial? Um, you know, so there, there are ways to do it. Um, it's getting better and better. You know, uh, you know, I, I'm just more of a, you know, I, I'm more on the side of a, a CBD type uh, resolution than I am for legal. I, like, I don't think legalizing marijuana is going to get us the effects we want from that perspective. So I, I rather see us do more work in the CBD area. Mark, explain to me what um, cannabis receptors are that are naturally in the body. I've never heard that before. 
Well, well, I mean, like when you start looking at, um, you know, like in the brain and, and so forth. So that, that's how the, the interaction works, the chemicals and so forth. So it's an anti-inflammatory response. Um, and I, and, you know, I'm not an expert in it, so I don't want to get, I don't, I'm not going to go into the weeds that I can't get into, but, um, <laughs> but, you know, there's a, like I said, anti-inflammatory <laughs> response. There's a, um, uh, a response with, um, you know, reactive oxygen species and so forth to help with that. And so there's a natural occurring chemical reaction there. So when you take the drug of say marijuana or, you know, cannabis plant, um, you know, that, that occurs. So you get those effects, but then there's other effects that aren't part of that, that happen like with THC and so forth. So, which is totally separate from the cannabis, but because, you know, it's tied to the plant, then, you know, everybody thinks it's the same. So that's why they started extracting the cannabis and the CBD oils and, and so forth. Um, and it can be done transdermally. It doesn't have to be oral. I mean, there's a lot of benefits in that way. But again, is it going to be significant where all of a sudden this is a miracle? No, because, it, it, you know, because chocolate has it, you know, I mean, coca. So, I mean, what's not all, all, only in uh, a marijuana plant, it's in other things too. So that's where where you get some effects with some of the other plants that, they, you, that people ingest. So I, the big, biggest thing is CBD oil is just not a way around it. There are some very good uh, benefits to it, but again, nothing so profound that, you know, one day you're down the dumps, the next day you're up and running around. It, you know, <laughs> again, it's just like everything else, you know, chronic usage, um, will tend to help keep down your inflammation and chronic inflammation. Yeah. Do you find overall, um, is it difficult to sell what you do and what you bring um, to certain populations? Maybe, maybe, um, maybe the leaders, maybe it's the, 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 the tactical athletes, maybe. So is it, you know, I think you know where I'm trying to go. Yeah, it, it is a tough sell. Um, you know, <clears throat> whether it's, you know, an NFL player or a tactical athlete or a, uh, NFL coach or, uh, you know, an officer, <clears throat> you know, what's in it for them in a sense of like, how does this make my, my individual better? How does this make my team better? Um, one of the problems you have is, not everything they're doing is conducive to making it better. So they don't want people to tell them they're not doing something right. Um, the other, cause they always think that's what you're gonna tell them. You, you know, they think, well, you're gonna come in and tell me I'm doing something wrong, so I'm not gonna listen. Um, the other is, you know, all this stuff's great, but if you don't have a willing participant, it doesn't mean anything. So a lot of it comes down to convenience, right? Hey, this is, this is great, but I don't have time to do that. What it, whatever, if their perception is they don't have time to do it, they're not gonna do it. And again, just like going to the weight room, you know, you're not going to go in there once, uh, lift, and then, okay, you don't have to lift for another year, right? <laughs> you you got to put time in. So all these things you have to put time in. And that's, that's you know, people want the quick fix, and it's just not there. I mean, no matter what, even if we do, like, medication, you know, for the most part, you know, medication takes a long time to get into your system to have the effect that we want. It's the same thing. The body is is built to for a long term sustainment. So we have to to get it optimized. It's going to be long term sustainment. And what are you know we're talking sports science? What are strength and conditioning coaches missing the boat on? If you were to pick maybe one or two things that you see our profession um, and it may you know especially you know, just getting into the profession, you know, what, what are the things you think the, the field is missing the boat on? Well, I, I think, you know, here, here's with strength and conditioning, <clears throat> especially strength training. At the end of the day, it's just physics, right? So, you know, it's gravity. We're trying to overcome gravity and, and so forth. So I think what we miss the boat on is this, you know, this, this middle ground of, listen, the foundation needs to be there. It doesn't matter how fancy you get. I don't care that you can stand on one leg on a, 
uh, physio ball and, and juggle. But if you can't drive the, the lane and, and hit that layup, it really doesn't matter, right? So what are the foundational things that you need to keep working on? And then also, I think the biggest thing we're missing is manipulating the training session to how the athlete is that day. And it's difficult because it takes a lot of work for a strength coach to do that. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's very cumbersome, as you know. But, it, you know, I think that's where, you know, we're not individualized enough, but sometimes we're too specialized, right? So, like, you know, hey, the end of the day, squat's a squat. So if you're playing hockey, it's a hockey squat. If you're playing football, it's a football squat. But at the end of the day, it's a squat, right? So uh, it's just gravity. It's just physics. Um, I think, you know, utilizing small little measures like, you know, whether it's a vertical jump, a force plate jump, or whatever to – to uh, assess if that athlete's ready for the, the load that you prescribed that day, you have to be willing to manipulate that load that would optimize their training for that day. doesn't mean just give them a day off, but it means just modulate some things. And it could be simple as, you know, just playing around with different, um, you know, uh, bar velocities, you know, velocity of the movement, you know, could be a, a, it's an easy way to manipulate training loads to optimize things when, when you have a fatigued athlete. But if it's a heavy day and an athlete's not ready for a heavy day, you're just wasting time. And it could be detrimental, but you're definitely wasting time. So I think that's the, that's the biggest thing I think we, we miss is, you know, keeping with the foundation and, and really connecting with our athlete on what they're ready for that day. And so are you using subjective, like surveying? Uh, how do you separate the mental fatigue from the physical fatigue, you know, aside from, I know you, you're doing heart rate variability. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously that's not practical for everybody to follow, um, you know, but I think, you know, it depends on your, your setting, right? If you're a college uh, strength coach for football and you have 150 people in your weight room, you know, depend on what size your staff is, you know, if you know your group well enough and kind of, you know, listen to some players, that can be your subjective. Um, there are, there are questionnaires that are very useful, but compliance is another thing. But if you like, again, if you go on a force plate and their force isn't matching what they should be, whether they're mental or physically, either way, they're fatigued. So, you know, you can manipulate that way. And that's where I, I would use like velocity based training type, things to replace if it's a heavy load day, if they're yeah. mentally fatigued. But again, it's, it's, it's hard. It's not easy because, you know, your, 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 your job's tied to performance as well. So if they're not performing on the field, you're the first one under the bus. <laughs> you know? No, they, uh, you know, the, the education factor is huge for the athlete. I mean, if we can deliver, deliver a message to an athlete is the better effort you give to you know, whether it be a force plate or whatever you're doing in the weight room, velocity-based training, the better intent you have, the better we can serve you as the uh, coach, you know, we, we'll get good, reliable data, uh, you know, because I think... It only works if they give that 100% effort, sure. right? It only works if right. they do that. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's that's great. Yeah, I mean, education is the key to all this. I mean, whether you're you know, a strength coach at a private facility or at a D1 school or pro or military, doesn't matter. Educating the athletes that you have on what you're trying to do, what your intent is and what, what you need from them and, and develop that relationship. The education and the foundation is everything. After that, if you don't have any of that, it doesn't matter what tricks you have up your sleeve. Because at the end of the day, it's just gravity, whether it's a rock or a barbell, 100 pounds is 100 pounds. And then as a strength coach, you need to, you know, have the awareness and, and really the drive to change culture. What can you do to provide the best possible environment? So I know that if we're playing every other day, if I ask guys to jump on a force plate on a practice day after a loss, they're not going to give effort. Right. I had to make an adjustment. And for, for me, the best effort I get is before games. First of all, I'm going to ask the guys, I'm priming them. So I'm going to ask the guys to jump anyways, do some sort of plyometric to get them ready to play. But at the same time, I was able to get, they're going to give good effort uh, and, and they're motivated. They're most motivated right before the game. Uh, but then I tied in that there's a, 
a teaching component to that to them jumping on the force plate. So I'm providing them feedback to help their performance, which is more of a coaching thing. So I think just, you know, you got to find different ways to implement these technologies in training uh, so that, uh, you know, they can then, you know, all of a sudden now that the athletes looking at their information, what do I got? What do, you know, right. like, what do I need to do? Uh, so I think just engaging them a little more is also helpful for the strength and conditioning coach as well. Yeah. I, I, I mean, the biggest part of the strength coach's job is that, that relationship building, because I mean, if you're in the NFL, you're only playing <clears throat> once a week and they only have practice three times a week. Um, as far as on, you know, on field practice, if you're in the NBA, you're, you know, you're, you're hardly ever home, right? You hardly ever your, your own facility. You're on the road, like say every other night or NHL. So I think it really, you know, if it's in professional setting or in the college setting, you know, your, your, your own culture is going to kind of dictate how you're going to address it. And just the, certainly the sport, because you can be the best NFL strength coach in the world and you jump into the NBA or the NHL and you're like, I can't do, sh I can't program off of this. <laughs> what do you mean you got to skate again? You know, uh, things like that. So, uh, you know, it, it's hard, you know, each, each is unique and each has unique skill set, and, 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 you know, but bottom line is that, that relationship building, if you have that rapport with that athlete, when they aren't doing so well and they can come to you and you help them problem solve, right. You can, you know, you can get with the other disciplines if you have to, or integrate them back in once they come from an injury standpoint. So they don't feel like it's either the, the training room or the weight room. It, you know, they feel that, that it, it goes and goes together. Those are important things to make that athlete feel that their best interest is being served. Cause at the end of the day, if their best interest isn't being served, the team's best interest is not being served and the organization's best interest is not being served. So even when I know the players think, Hey, you just care about what management and ownership thinks. But it's not the exact opposite because if you're doing really well, all the other stuff will take care of itself. So, um, and the player has to know that that you are there for them, and and you have to realize at the end of the day you're there to serve them. That's that's your job. That's what that's that's why we're there. If you don't have athletes, then you don't have a job. So um, you know they don't need to treat you like that. But you have to understand that you need to be available for them emotionally and um, physically there for them. Mark, how do you get the providers of the services to be a team? Um, <laughs> Very difficult. <laughs> we all have egos, right? Everybody wants to be the man, be the, you know, everybody wants to be that person that made the difference and they want whatever internally feel like they're, they're the one, um, you know, different places I've been, you know, it's always been a challenge and, and my colleagues out there have the same, you know, challenges. It's, it's hard to get a team of individuals together that work well together uh, of the different disciplines. Um, the military is, it's still a challenge, but we have authority. So if I'm the boss, you don't have a choice. It's military law. So you got to do it, right? So it's a little easier in, in, as far as a programmatic sense, but you still get undermining, you still get all that. So you still have to put together a right, you know, the correct team. And, you know, when I was back at my previous command, it took me probably about five years before I really got a, a solid team together that we worked you know, well and seamlessly together. It took a long time. I went through a lot of different people that just didn't fit, if you will, for one reason or another. It was too much for them or they weren't good enough for us, one or the other. Have you used any personality assessments or training or anything like that um, with the athletes or the providers? Well, not the providers because then you're talking to human resource uh, mm -hmm. potential violations. So, uh, so depending on where you're at, so, so it's not, not as simple, um, you know, definitely with, uh, you know, like in the military, obviously our, our service members go through some uh, psychological assessments to see if they're a good fit for what we want them for. Um, 
in sport, you know, at the end of the day, you know, if, if the GM thinks this guy's good, they're going to go for him. Right. I mean, it doesn't matter. So in that sense, um, like we know, I don't know how the NBA combine is, but the NFL combine, no, you know, nobody uses it. I mean, it's really, it's more of a media thing. And, um, we, we don't use that inf the, the information we already know the film tells a lot, you know, and the medical, I mean, it's used for the medical assessment for sure, you know, but, um, as far as all the skill stuff, you know, we're watching film. If they have a bad day at the combine and they, they have two years of great tape, we don't care what the combine said. Right. So, um, you know, f you know, the, the, the wonder lick and all that stuff, I, you know, that might, that might sway a guy one way or the other if they're, you know, trying to choose between two guys or their the way their system is is more you know study based versus visual based or something like that. But mainly, uh, you know, they don't use that. It doesn't carry a ton of weight. I mean, there's a thing called the AIQ. I don't know if you guys use that, Javar. Um, you know, that's a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah it, it's more of a. Um, a psychological assessment, but it's, it's, it's a little bit more um, practical. So it's not just, it's not, it's more fluid intelligence. It's not just, or emotional intelligence, spatial awareness and things like that. It's, it's a, uh, it's more predictive of, it doesn't tell you that this guy's good or not good. It tells you this, this is what I'm looking for. Does this guy fit what I'm looking for? Mm -hmm. So he might be, you know, you know, someone could be dumb as rocks, but you know, incredible, you know, athletic ability and, and you're just looking for credible athletic ability and, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, so th this kind of puts it in, you know, makes, it, it takes all different angles and looks at it and not just, you know, like a wonder like, which is just intelligence. So it's the AIQ it's, it's used in the NFL, uh, the NBA, some teams in the NBA use it. And I know, uh, NHL, um, a lot of teams in the NHL are using it too. It's more for you know drafting and, and, or trades and stuff like that. No, if anyone's interested, it's look up Dr. Scott Goldman. Um, he's the one who developed it, and he's with the Lions as a uh, mental performance expert. Um, but no, it, it's promising. That the tough thing is to convince uh, front office, you know, <laughs> to to use, uh, you know, new things because they have so much data on the old thing. Right. And so, uh, but the, the cool thing about that one uh, is that he has compiled a lot of information over the past few years that can help us kind of, you know, interpret things a little bit faster, I think. Right. And, and that's, and that's the beauty of it is that it's, it's just showing you a profile of a guy and then you decide if that guy's fitting what you want sure, and they'll explain yeah. what the profile is, but you're still making that decision. It's not the psychologist saying, Hey, you should take this guy. Or you shouldn't take this guy. Yeah. You know, it's, it's you decide, Hey, this guy fits what we're looking for. Right. He'll fit in our system or he'll fit in that role or whatever it is, or he won't. So, um, you know, that, that's kind of the beauty of it because it gives you more, it gives the organization more control and knowledge versus mm -hmm. someone telling them they should or should. Yeah. And it was intriguing too, because they can, you can also get some pretty cool information to help coach the athlete, you know? So once they're in your organization, you could use this profile to help coach them or from a sports scientist perspective, bring this information to the coaches and say, Hey, you know, this is this, I mean, it could be as simple as visual, kinesthetic, you know, things like that, as far as uh, learning goes, but uh, it's some, some useful insight. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I've known Scott, I, I was the one who got him to come to the Lions. So I knew him before the Lions and so forth, but I did use um, uh, a, a version of the AIQ for, we did a pilot, um, not a study, but like a little pilot case study, to look at a small group to see if the AIQ would fit in the military. Um, and it was, it was pretty interesting because we have a lot of other psychological batteries, so we could match it up with that and see if it was telling us, you know, you know, the same thing or more or not at all. And it, and it held up pretty, it held up really good. We just, uh, you know, obviously didn't, um, at this point still haven't gone through with it because still weak on the, 
the amount of information he has on this on the service member. But with you know football, he can break it down to positions, and same in basketball and hockey. Military is a lot tougher because the positions aren't. It's not the same. So it's, right. it'll take a little while to get there, but it's got some promise. Interesting. Yeah, well, this has been good. Mark, do you have any questions for us or? No, I mean, I think this has been great. I love talking shop. I mean, especially nowadays, we, you know, we can't go to conferences anymore, right? So it's hard to talk shop with, uh, with your your colleagues and so forth. So this has been awesome. I mean, I'd love to, love to keep this up. Uh, you know, Ted and I talk uh, now and again, but uh, this has been great. I really appreciate you having me on here. It's been awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Great information. You know, yeah. sometimes people don't think one person should know all of what you know. <laughs> well, I I have a lot. I have a great network. What I did really well was, you know, get a good network because, uh, you know, like the team at R and I, um, unbelievable. You know, some of the work that they're doing in different areas that I'm not involved in that will, you know, carries over some of it overlaps, you know, awesome people. Uh, the team I had, at, at, you know, my former command, unbelievable, you know, to even, you know, think outside the box and, and you know, what doesn't exist. Um, I, and I think, you know, that's probably, you guys probably know, the biggest thing you could do is, is create the network because you're not going to know everything, but you're going to know enough to, where to go get the exact answer, what you need to do to put it forward and actionable. And yeah. that's basically what I did. Well, it's been a pleasure. You guys have anything else? No, no I think more. Just a... Can we add on one thing? What is the biggest, so we brought Navy SEALs in all of this. You've, you've worked with athletes, you work with the military. When it comes to leadership, what is the biggest difference, this is probably something good to, to end on, is what is the biggest difference between the military leader and the, and the sport athlete leader? What are, what are the intrinsic qualities that you would say separates the two, if there, if there are any differences? Great question. Yeah, well, you know, everybody's a leader. At some point, some situation, you have to be able to step in. But what, what I find, and I had an admiral tell me this, a retired admiral, <clears throat> but what makes a great leader, and this is what the military does well, because they do have a, a structure in place. So we can you know, disagree, we can fight, bicker, but when things go down, all of a sudden, you're, you know when to take orders and you know when to give orders. But a good leader knows when not to lead, all right? So that's the biggest thing. You don't, to, you know, to be a good leader, you could sit back and say, hey, you got this, you know, you're my, you know, senior enlisted guy, or you have more experience at this. My job is to make sure I get you the resources to get your job done versus I'm in charge. And, you know, I think in the special ops community is what you're really talking about. That's what they do best. They are different than the, the regular service where it is very like, I said this, so you do that. But, you know, at the end of the day, your commander is in charge. And I had uh, somebody higher up the chain that I dealt with. And, you know, my immediate commander wanted me to do something different than he did. And he's like, well, he's your commander, so you got to go with him. And he was higher. But that's good leadership because I, you know, in his mind, you know, I am, you know, I, I made him the leader for a reason. So I have to trust in him. So, you know, he was leading by not leading at that point. And, you know, I think that's, those are the biggest differences in the athlete world to be a leader. You have to know how to get your people to, to work with you and you to work with them and also for them. And it's hard. It's hard for, to get some of these kids. And just because you're a big, strong guy, you're the leader. It puts a lot of pressure on, extra pressure when they're trying to make it themselves. Or they just landed this huge contract. So now everybody's looking at them. That's a lot of pressure. And then you want to throw leadership in. It's hard. And I think education could do better in the professional world on helping these guys be better leaders in the locker room versus dictators in the locker room. Wow. 
A, a good podcast should always end on a good question and a good answer. So that was awesome. Uh, thank you all. This has been uh, a really good podcast. I'm excited for this one to come out. So with that being said, Mark, it's been a, um, great to have you on as our guest. We'd love to have you on again in the future. And hopefully we can get together face-to-face -to -face at a conference one day, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yep, so that being said, thank you all. This has been a Research to Reps Roundtable. You all have a good night.